so I'm going to talk, uh, I'm going to give a, the first half will be a survey, a bit of a survey. Uh, but then after that, I'll be talking about joint work with Adam Clay. Okay, so uh, for conventions throughout, well, I'm going to be talking about three manifolds, and when I use W, that's going to be a closed, connected, uh, orientable, irreducible three manifold. And M uh, will be compact, and with all these adjectives. And the boundary of M will be a union of tori. OK, and then uh, towards the end of the talk, I'll need N, which is just going to be, it's a twisted eye bundle over the Klein bottle. So it's, a, it's an eye bundle over the Klein bottle, but it's twisted. So this is a, an orientable manifold. for the Klein bottle. OK, so uh, sort of the three uh, key players here are different properties, uh, three different properties of a three that you can put on a three manifold. Uh, they're quite different on the face of it. So uh, let's define them. So I'm going to say, and Josh, uh, Josh Green gave a mini course last week on these things. So we're going to say W is TTF if it admits a co-oriented Todd foliation. So I don't want to go into uh, complete details in terms of this definition, but uh, for us, this means it's a co-dimension one foliation on the three manifold. And what that is, is a partition of W into subsets, which uh, locally, uh, it looks like a deck of cards uh, stacked up. So the, locally, the subsets are pieces of surfaces, which uh, stack up one on one top, top of the other. That's foliation. To say co you're co-oriented means that at every point, uh, of the manifold, if you look at the, uh, the bit of the partition, the leaf it's called, going through there, I have a well-defined, well, I choose a normal direction. Now, you just want that those normal directions vary coherently around the manifold. They vary uh, uh, continuously. And being taught, that's co-oriented. And then taught means that through any leaf, that's one of these partition things, I can find a loop, goes through it, and it's everywhere transverse to the foliation. So it's a fact that, and Josh sketched this last week, every uh, three manifold W of this form has a foliation. Uh, it's not, but it's not true that it's necessarily, that you can find which one which is co-oriented and taut. So that it's a definite restriction on the three manifold. I mean, for instance, a fundamental group of a three manifold, uh, which admits going to Todd foliation, has to be infinite. So, in particular, you couldn't find one on S three. So I'll say that W is then L S if it is not a Hagard Fleur L space. So this is going to be, the Hagar Fleur is going to be a black box today. I'll just, it is what it is. Uh, I'll say some words that, which may or may not mean anything, but so there's, um, it's a Lagrangian uh, Fleur theory, which uh, means you're in some sort of symplectic setup. You have a pair of Lagrangians, and it's a homology theory generated by the intersection points between those two Lagrangians. Now, in the context of three manifolds, you build a symplectic manifold associated to the three manifold, and the Lagrangians are associated to a Hagard splitting. So that's why it's called Hagard Fleur. And uh, so 
uh, Hagard Fleur L space is our um, uh, three manifolds which have the absolute minimum and uh, the smallest possible Hagard Fleur homology. And finally, uh, LO, if pi 1w left orderable. So I'll just call that LO. And here I will say something more. It's, it's much easier to uh, describe what this means. So uh, a group G is LO if uh, one, it's non-trivial. So that's a convention we take, which is convenient, particular for three manifolds, and two, there exists a total order on G such that uh, it's left invariant. The multi uh, in other words, multiplication by on the left preserves the order. Okay. Okay. So it, it's clear on the face of it, these things don't appear to have very much to do with each other. Okay, now uh, I want to say, make a few remarks on LO. Uh, so maybe just some obvious examples uh, said, well, the reals are left orderable uh, just with, with respect to uh, the usual order in addition. And so any non-trivial subgroup of the reals inherits left order. But of course not everything's LO. LO implies G is torsion free. And this is actually a very uh, simple exercise. For instance, if we start out with some, something which is bigger than one, well then I just left multiply by G on uh, see G squared equals G times G bigger than G times 1 equals G. So if G is bigger than 1, then G squared is bigger than G and etc. You know, G to the N bigger than G to the N minus 1. You just proceed like that. So there's no way you, you, you can't eventually have G to the N equal 1. So they're torsion free. So finite groups uh, are not left orderable. And for when we're looking at fundamental groups of uh, three manifolds like M, so it's a, it's a consequence of uh, various results in three manifolds that for these manifolds of the sort W that we're looking at here, if they have torsion in their fundamental group that they're finite. So either the group is finite or it uh, has no torsion. Okay, so um, a key example of a left orderable group it's sort of a universal example in some sense for, for countable groups, it's homeo plus r, and it's, it's not at all hard to see why uh, this is left orderable. You see, this embeds into r to the uh, n. So here we have, uh, let's list q. This, and then we can associate to every homeomorphism its values on the rationals. And since the rationals are dense, that's, that's clearly an, an, an injective map here. And um, in, I can give R to the N the lexicographical order. So uh, if I take two elements of R to the N, I look at the, which are different. I look at the first coordinate where they differ and then just look, is, which coordinate is bigger for one of them than the other, and that's the bigger element. So for homeomorphisms, I take two F and G, I look at the two lists, FR1, FR2, etc., GR1, GR2, etc. I look where they first differ, say FRN is different than GRN, and then I just ask which, which one is bigger. 
say FRN is bigger than GRN, well then you declare F bigger than G. And uh, it's, it's a simple exercise uh, to see that that gives a left order on here, it's left invariant. a uh, left order an LO on okay so that's a key example and uh, eraser The fact, the basic fact is that, so I think that's a three, four. If I have uh, a non trivial group G, which is countable, is left LO if and only if there exists an objective homomorphism. Go so from plus. Okay, and uh, well, I don't want to talk about the proof very much, but it's not that it's not that difficult. There's a bit of a there is a subtle point in it, but quite very very roughly, you embed G is countable, and it's not hard to see that you can map G to the reals, perhaps as a dense subset, um, so that uh, the order is preserved. And then, so we have this subset of the reals which uh, can be identified with G, and you have left multiplication. G times G1, uh, et cetera. You know. Left multiplication by G, an element G of G, uh, gives a, uh, well, uh, determines an automorphism of the, the subset of the reals. And then if you're really careful, this is the subtle point, you have to be careful how you embed G into the reals. But if you, you take uh, good care, then you can see that this, at, le Action by left translation elements of G on this subset of R extends to um, an embedding of, the of G itself in homeo plus R, which you verify as a homomorphism. In fact, in, yeah, an injective homomorphism. Okay. So, uh, in that sense, homeo plus R is uh, sort of universal for countable uh, left orderable groups. You can actually, there's a canonical choice of uh, this representation. This is where you, you make the embedding of G into R as tight as possible, and you end up with something called the dynamic realization of G. It's the fundamental invariant of uh, a left orderable group, uh, this uh, dynamical, realiza uh, dynamical realization of the left order. It's this representation. It's well defined up to conjugacy in homeo plus R. Now, for three manifolds, Three-manifold groups are special in many ways. And in this context, it's a, a result, pi 1, w is LO, if and only if there exists a homomorphism, say, psi from pi 1, w onto, it, onto an LO group. Okay, so you don't... Uh, actually have to, to show the group itself, uh, pi 1w is LO, you just have to show it surjects onto a, a left orderable group. This is a, uh, uh, a straightforward consequence of the scott shalin core theorem and uh, the Burns-Hale theorem from theory of left order groups. Okay. And uh, then going back to here, this is if and only if or existent on trivial homomorphism. Into uh, of uh, pi 1 w into homeo plus r. So in fact, understanding, if you're given a three manifold uh, like w and uh, it you want to know whether it's uh, LO or not? Well, it's equivalent to finding a homomorphism from pi 1 w to homeo plus r with non trivial image.
Okay, so like I said, the three properties, LO, CTF, NLS, are quite different. But remarkably, there's no known example where they differ. So, So for instance, if the first Betty number of W is uh, strictly positive, then uh, W has co-oriented taught foliation. This is Dave Gabay's thesis, done uh, 1983. Uh, w is LO. Uh, well, this is a consequence of, you see, if the first Betty number is positive, then there is a surjection of uh, pi 1w to h1w and then on to z. So, um, but z is a left orderable group. So, if I use this criterion, uh, for um, uh, pi 1 of w is LO if and only if I can, sur I can find a surjective homomorphism onto a left orderable group. Well, this is automatically satisfied if... Uh, the first Betty number of W is bigger than zero. So that was a paper of mine with Dale Rolfson and Bert Feast. And uh, W is NLS. Again, I, you know, I, as I mentioned, the, the Hagard Fleur stuff is going to be a bit of a black box. So I'll just say the uh, thing is, to be a, a Hagard Fleur L space, you have to be a rational homology three sphere. You have to have the first Betty number zero. So I'll just say by def. If you're in L space, then the, just by definition, the first Betty number is zero. So this will hold. So from now on, I'm going to consider rational homology three spheres. So in other words, I. W is finite. So a W a rational homology sphere. Okay. So this is uh, if you want to investigate uh, these these various properties, CTF, LO, and NLS, we're really you know reduced by stuff at which had been done earlier to the case where you're in a rational homology three sphere. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's more space. There are some known relations between the various concepts. So if you have a coriented taut foliation, then you're, you're not in L space. Now, this is, uh, well, if the current to top foliation is C2 smooth, then it's a result of osfeth Uh If it's not, if it's a, just a topological current to top foliation, then you have to use recent work of uh, Will Cazes and Rachel Roberts, and independently Jonathan, Jonathan Bowden, um, to do this. So uh, these appeared, these two papers appeared last year. And so uh, CTF implies NLS. Uh, if you are CTF as well, this implies that the commutator subgroup of W is LO. So remember, W is a rational homology three sphere. Its first homology uh, is finite. That means the commutator subgroup is a finite index. 
in, the, in here. So um, if W has coriented tau foliation, then uh, there is a finite cover, which has a left W tilde, which has a left variable fundamental group. In fact, this was the, uh, so back in two, 2003, uh, both uh, Caligari Dunfield and uh, Rachel Roberts, uh, Melanie Stein, and John Tureshian used this, this, uh, this type of argument to show that there were uh, three manifolds without coriant to talk foliations. I mean, ones which say hyperbolic ones. But this particular statement, this is due to Caligari Dunfield. Caligari Dunfield. Um, here, if you're LO, then an argument of Sam uh, Llewellyn and Adam, Adam Levine shows that you're not a strong L space, which is a special type of L space. Okay, so these are, are direct quasi relations. Uh, well, that's definitive. This is up to taking a finite cover, and this is uh, true up to uh, looking at a very special type of L space. Uh, nevertheless, after uh, a lot of examples had been looked at, so two conjectures came out. So conjecture one, due to myself with Cameron Gordon and Liam Watson, is that uh, W, L O if and only if, W is CTF, uh, sorry, is NLS. And conjecture two, well, it's a bit, I'm not exactly sure who to attribute this to, but I'm going to put down some names. So, Ajva Sabo and uh, Yuhash, uh, that what's a conjecture? W is CTF, if and only if W is NLS. Uh, so, in, in fact, what the reality is, is that when Ashvath and Zabo showed CTF implies NLS, they asked, is the, is the opposite true? And uh, the first time I saw this written down as a conjecture was in a survey article of Uhash, but I, I really don't, uh, I don't know if he was claiming uh, credit for the conjecture or not. At any rate, uh, here it is, uh, the conjecture. So, conjecturally, then, uh, each of these uh, extremely, quite different, quite disparate concepts, properties for a three-manifold are equivalent. Okay, and there's been a lot of, I'll, I'll talk about some evidence now. And uh, there's been a lot of efforts uh, to try to generate examples. There's been a lot of effort to find counterexamples. But uh, they're still standing, the conjectures, as we speak. So first of all, um, it follows from the work of a bunch of people, and I hope I'm not forgetting anybody. But so this is Eisenbach, Hirsch, Neumann. Uh, I've already mentioned the paper with uh, Dale Rolfson and Bert Feast, uh, Liska Stipschitz, and then the paper with Gordon and Watson uh, that the conjectures are true. If W is a non hyperbolic geometric three manifold hyperbolic, non hyperbolic. So, roughly, well, not roughly, exactly speaking, what this means is. Uh, the two conjectures can be verified to hold for all manifolds which are either ciphered fibered or admit a sol geometry. There has been a fair amount of uh, work looking at branch covers of S3. So uh, 
um, work of Oz Vassavo combined with uh, the work of myself with Cameron Gordon and Liam Watson shows that conjectures hold for the two full branch cover of a non-split alternating knot. So one interesting point here is that there are many hyper, these are generically hyperbolic. So all these, none of these manifolds here were hyperbolic, but these are generically hyperbolic. Um, uh, Nathan Dunfield has done, uh, well, I'll come back to him in a, in a few minutes, but he's done a lot of experimentation and quite literally gone through hundreds of examples, uh, thousands of examples looking at knots, say up to 15 crossings, looking into two full branch cover. And uh, so there are hundreds of thousands of those. And then uh, trying to determine by machine calculation whether you're CTF, LO, or uh, NLS. Now, another paper, uh, Gordon and Lidman uh, study F, LO, NLS. For sigma nk, the n-fold uh, branch cyclic cover k, where k is varying over certain uh, families of knots. Okay. Two, three, Dain surgery. Well, there are lots of examples for Dain surgery. And actually, it's a good, good point because typically what happens, you see, to, for a rational multi three sphere to determine whether it's CTFLO or NLS is really hard. For in general, if someone just throws it out at you, it's, it's, in, it's very, very difficult. And it turns out that for certain families, it's easy, you know, maybe you can show it's uh, NLS for certain families or uh, CTF. But that then drops certain problems in. If you know, for instance, that they're CTF, well, then you ask, do these things, like typically, uh, non-trivial Dain surgeries on an alternating knot is CTF. And so, uh, well, you can ask, are they LO or the NLS? So interesting problems arise here. And let me uh, just mention that. Let me just mention one. So here's a theorem. whose exact, uh, I don't know exactly who it's to be credited to, but it goes, certainly goes back to Ajva Sabu, who, who set up the, you know, the basic material for d doing this. But so if k, a non-trivial knot in S3, and kr, an L space, so what I mean by this, uh, this is R-frame uh, surgery. R, well, the R-dane surgery on the knot K. I'll space some R bigger than zero. Then KR is NLS. If and only if R is less than two times the genus of the knot minus one. Okay. So it's a wonderful characterization of what happens on knots. Either none of the Dane fillings give an L space, or the ones which give an L space are exactly the ones uh, where the surgery coefficient is bigger than or equal to 2G, two times the genus of the knot minus 1. So that immediately you come up with the question, uh, do comp okay, can you prove something comparable? Yeah. Yeah, so R0, yeah, thank you. Some R0 bigger than zero. Yeah. Well, then you see, that's why I chose R0 bigger than zero. If I said R0 less than zero, then I'd have to flip everything around. 
Okay, so um, does something comparable hold? When NL is replaced by CTF by LO. So there's, uh, there's uh, this is definitive, right? This tells you exactly what's happening. For uh, Dane's surgery on optin S3 for uh, giving L space is not, in fact, the recent work of Hanselman, uh, Rasmussen, Rasmussen, and Watson, and, and you know, as a group and a subset, have uh, extended this to a much more general uh, situation than knots in uh, S3. Um, but there are partial things known. So, for instance, uh, example. Say K a non special alternating knot. So alternating knots come into flavors, special and non special. The non special are the generic ones. The special ones are things like torus knots and whatever. So then Ajva Sabo AR is not an L space for all. Rational surgeries are. So for every surgery except the meridional surgery, uh, Rachel Roberts, AR is CTF for all R and Q, but <laughs> it's unknown. Um, Yeah, the, in fact, there's very little is known about this. Actually, Nathan Dunfield's talk on Friday will address uh, ways of showing that many Dane fillings, uh, Dane surgeries on knots uh, have left orderable fundamental groups. Okay, and then finally, in terms of evidence, let me mention uh, Nathan, just bring back Nathan's, uh, uh, ex, uh, well, machine calculation. So I, I got to say that Nathan has taken the attitude at the beginning that the conjectures are false. And so he's been working really hard for about four or five years to find counterexamples. And uh, as such, he's amassed a lot of experimental data. And, and to date, none of it is, uh, has shown, well, the conjectures are still standing. So Dunfield. examined <laughs> literally hundreds of thousands of, uh, uh, of, of uh, you know, I guess more than a half million that would be fair enough to say arising from either see branch covers of knots or from the census from the tables from Sigma 2K, or uh, okay, and uh, of course, no no counterexamples. So uh, I, one thing I should point out about these: these are all these aren't generic examples. For the for example, the ones in the census, these are. Uh, Relatively few, if you look at their de uh, geometric decomposition into tetrahedra, for instance, it's relatively few, say up to eight or something like that. And uh, uh, for these, well, these, these manifolds all have strong evolutions, and as such, they're not going to be generic. Nevertheless, I'll take this as positive. Okay, so now, yeah. Well, it's a machine calculation, so it doesn't always, uh, you can't always tell. He sets it off. So, for instance, to tell something's not left orderable, that is algorithmic. You can, you can write a program and it starts running. 
And hopefully, after a, a certain amount of time, it tells you, no, not left rotor ball. And so typically, uh, he found that worked very efficiently. Here, so somehow you start out looking it's for something in the, you, know, you take a particular presentation, you look in the Cayley graph, you know, you're looking at the ball of radius one in there, then the ball of radius two, radius three, radius four, and at each time you're looking at a new ball, you're, you're looking for something, and if that, you find something, then that will obstruct being uh, left orderable. And he said typically you only have to go out to the ball of radius five to find it. Even, you know, these are knots up to 15 crossings. Um, there are re reasonably good uh, algorithms for calculating Hagard flare homology, so he, that can be calculated. Uh, he's, he's developed a method for, uh, you know, finding out whether there's a coriented type foliation. You know, he, he builds a certain type of branch surface and very special and, anyway, it's very effective uh, way of doing this. Now, if you want to show uh, it is left orderable, so these are things like showing not a left order. If you want to show it is left orderable, that's, that's tough, right? You have to find a left order. And so for us, that means we have to get a representation to homeo plus r. Well, that, that's a bit of a mess, right, to try, try to get people just don't know how to, in general, at least I don't know how to, uh, to see. Like, you know, you, you have a chance if you want to look at, to find representations into uh, SL2 tilde or something. We kind of understand the, uh, the geometry, the topology of that group, and somehow you might be able to, to see your way to finding a representation. And in fact, what he, that's what he does, is he asks, he looks for representations in SL2R, which he, he you know, he, that is something he can study algorithmically. And once he's got it, then he asks, is that, you try to lift that representation to SL2R to into SL2 tilde. And there's an Euler class obstruction, which can be reasonably straightforwardly calculated. So that's what he does. So, yeah, so at the end of the day, what he'll tell you is, okay, I looked at uh, 500,000 examples. I can tell these ones are left orderable. These ones are not left orderable. These ones are uh, L spaces. Uh, these are not L spaces, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, I think you can find on his website, he's, he's got, he has an article where he describes this experimental work. Okay, so to... The theorem I want to talk about is, um, well, today the, the only uh, sort of one general result I stated uh, was for a non-geometric, um, non-hyperbolic geometric manifolds, the conjectures hold. And in particular, it holds for Seifert manifolds. But uh, what I want to talk about today for the rest of the time is that if W is a graph manifold, rational homology sphere, then W is LO, if and only if W is CTF, and that's if and only if, but I'm, let me do it like this because there are various groups of people working on this WNLS. Okay, so uh, this bit is due to myself and Adam Clay. Um, and then, well, uh, the foliations we construct here are topological. So we, at the time we were doing this, we couldn't apply um, the Oshvath-Sabo argument to deduce this. But nevertheless, nevertheless the, the foliations we constructed are fairly nice, and so we could show for these examples, these foliations, that this implies it's NLS. Of course, since we did this, um, uh, Wilkes and Rachel Roberts produced their paper, which just said in general, if you have a CTF manifold, you're not in L space. So put them there, or Jonathan Bowden did this. But um, this other direction, so uh, as I'll explain, the, the proofs uh, of, of these things, uh, like the equivalence here, the equivalence here, all have the same flavor. And ultimately, you need a gluing theorem. And uh, certainly, that the, the gluing theorems 
for, uh, for Hagar fluor homology is what you need here and certainly weren't, uh, Adam and I had no idea what to do, but quite recently in joint work and, uh, and in separate work, so with uh, Jonathan Hanselman and Liam Watson, um, Jake Rasmussen and Sarah Rasmussen, and in, in a joint paper, RR, W, uh, they proved, they proved this. Okay, it's really, really, really nice uh, recent work. Okay, so uh, in the time remaining, I want to talk uh, about this. I'm going to first, though, state a, just look at a special case and state a couple of problems, which are completely wide open. Any information that could be obtained on it would be very interesting. So, so let's look at, uh, rather than rational homology three spheres, we're going to look at Z homology three spheres, graph manifold Z. Well, I'm going to start with Z homology three spheres, uh, graph manifold Z homology three spheres. So that just means they're uh, graph manifolds which have the same homology as the three sphere. There's a theorem of uh, Michel Boileau and uh, me that if w a graph manifold set hs then w is ctf if and only if w is not s3 or sigma 235 that's the point curry homology sphere so I have to say here that, uh, yeah, what you're seeing is see, really other than these two's example, everything is CTF. Uh, and uh, hence, everything is LO, everything is NLS. Um, but that's not, the, that's not the case. The minute the, you, you go out of the, the, the realm of etymology three through the rest of three spheres, you know, uh, there's no generic behavior. Roughly half of them have the properties, the other half don't. Okay, so, this um, is a special case of a more general conjecture of Ashfaz Sabo, which is, uh, I think, uh, quite interesting and worth pointing out. So it, it has been called the Hegard Fleur Poincare conjecture. Sabo, if W is an irreducible ZHS, Z homology sphere, then W is NLS, if only if W does not equal S5. So you see it's uh, Amongst the world of irreducible tetramology three spheres, uh, Hagar Fleur homology, the, the fact whether being in L space or not, is uh, uh, determining the three sphere, uh, modulo sigma 235. <laughs> okay, so um, there's a conjecture, but this raises a problem, like I said. You know, if you believe in the conjectures, or at least you know, the conjectures are, are, those conditions are strongly correlated, then you know, you wonder whether show W uh, is CTF, respectively, LO, if only if W does not equal Okay. So the, these are these are wide open questions, and like I said, you know, if you take your favorite family of etymology three spheres, and see if you can say something about CTF LO or NLS for that. For instance, this is known to hold for uh, etymology three spheres obtained by surgery on a knot. Okay, so you can get infinitely many different etymology three spheres by one over n surgery on a knot. And I, again, that I'm not exactly sure who that's due to. The first place I saw it was in a paper by Matt Hedden and Liam Watson. Uh, so, uh, but 
it's, you know, and various things are known. So recent work of Tao Li and Rachel Roberts show that uh, for all but finitely many Dane surgeries one of the form, one of Varan on not in S3, your CTF. And actually, consequently, your LO, using something called the Thurston's Universal Circle Construction. Okay, so there's a family of, of Zetamol G3 spheres which arise naturally, those which arise from surgery on knots in S3, where at least for a given knot, up to uh, removing finitely many surgeries, um, all these conditions hold your uh, NLS, uh, CTF, LO. Okay, so how do you... Theorem is based on something called slope detection. So I'm going to simplify things. I'm going to think of M. Now only look, remember M is a compact, connected, orientable, irreducible, three manifold, whose boundary is union of tori. But let's just assume uh, the boundary of M is connected. OK, you can do what I'm going to talk about more generally, but it just gets too complicated to be much interest in this talk. OK, so um, S of M, these are the slopes on boundary M equal to H1. Sorry, it's the projective space. All right, so the picture you should have So once I choose a basis, say we choose a basis in H1T, so this contains that, uh, Z2. So once I choose a basis for H1 of T in Z2, then I can you know, just m map it out here where uh, These are the, the first homology of the torus is just the lattice here. And then on the other hand, the first homology with the real coefficients is the background plane. And so, is there any color? No. Uh, you're looking at lines. So an element of this projective space is just a line which goes through the origin, and you call it rational if uh, alpha can be taken to be in the first homology with uh, just uh, z coefficients. Okay, those are the ones which uh, go through a lattice point. Okay. So what I'm going to do, I, I'll, I'll tell you in very broad terms what the, how the proof works, and then I'll, you know, whatever, whatever time's remaining, we'll uh, discuss some of the points in the proof. Okay, so um, there are four ways. Well, there are more, but there are four ways that interest us. Uh, interest me <laughs> in uh, four ways to describe subsets of distinguished slopes. NSM. 
and distinguished, in fact, we're going to call them detected slopes. You can use foliations, representations, left orders, and L spaces. So in other words, for each, say we take foliations, we're going to define something called default, det set of detected slopes detected by foliations. This would be DREP word and and um, so the proof of the theorem on the graph manifolds. Uh, well, there are two steps. You have to prove two results. You have to prove a detection theorem. So if M ciphered, all these methods give the same family of slopes. All M. So all these four methods of, of detecting slopes uh, actually give the same family of slopes on the boundary. Um, say, and we'll call that just D of M. And then there's a gluing result. W, M1 on a torus M2, where M1, M2 ciphered, then W, ETF, respectively LO, respectively NLS. If and only if D, the, so the set of detected slopes uh, coming from M1 here's W there's this uh, M1, M2 and there's a torus T so there's a set of slopes on T determined by both M1 and by M2, the set of detected slopes. And we want those two sets to have a non-trivial non intersection. Okay, so now you can see how, at least in the special case of uh, the theorem, of a special case of graph manifold, uh, which you see, I, I want to know, is it CTF? Well, it's if and only if DM1 intersect DM2 is non-trivial. But the same thing for LO or NLS. And, uh, well, that's, that's all there is to it. So uh, the condition for being CTF is, is equivalent to the condition for being LO or condition for being NLS. So the three properties are the same. So this gluing result, I guess Adam Clay and I did it for CTF and LO, and for the NLS gluing result, that was the work of uh, Hanselman, of the two Rasmussens, and Liam Watson. Okay. So I don't have a lot of time, so I think what I'll, I'll do is I'll just describe what, very briefly, uh, what foliation detection is, what uh, order detection is, and what uh, NLS detection is. By the way, all these properties or ways of detecting aren't are, are very natural. So uh, 
you take a, uh, again, boundary M is T, and that I'm going to assume that alpha is rational, just to simplify things. I mean, you could have an irrational slope being detected, but let's do this. So uh, alpha foliation detected if there exists a, a co-oriented tot foliation on M such that F is transverse to the boundary of M, that's T, and to draw the picture. If I look at F intersect boundary of M, well, I'll have a, some, so what, what's F intersect boundary of M? Since it's, F is transverse to boundary of M, that's a co-dimensional wind foliation of the boundary. So it's just a foliation of this boundary torus uh, by, it could be a combination of lines and circles. And to say that alpha is foliation detected, well, alpha, uh, if it's rational, you re recall here that alpha, then I take it to be in the first homology. And what I want is that there's at least one circle. There exists at least one circle. Alpha. Take the boundary of M. Okay, I want at least one. And if so, you, you call, you say that that slope alpha is, is uh, detected by that foliation F, but, but more generally that the slope is foliation detected. There's a equally simple notion of order detection. Uh, so, but first of all, so let O be a left order on pi 1m. Then you look at the restricted, restriction of O to pi 1m uh, is an order on Z2. So the fundamental group of the boundary of M is Z2. And this is an exercise, which I don't know if you did last week or not, uh, the students here, but given a left order on Z2, uh, so what is that doing? The Z2, which I'm thinking of now in this plane, the plane R2, uh, some elements are positive, some elements are negative. But what you can show is that there's a line, there's a unique line determined by the order, it's such that on one side of the line, everything is bigger than zero, and on the other side, everything is less, less than zero. That's a fairly simple exercise. So the order, uh, so that line is uniquely determined by the order. And so that's giving me a slope. So every left order, we say that alpha is order detected. If I can find a left order on M, uh, which one I restricted, restricted to the boundary, I get that line, minus slope alpha. Okay, and then finally, I'll finish off in the last minute with uh, NLS detection, which appears quite ad hoc, but uh, because I suppose in a way it is. I mean, the hagar fleur people presumably can take what I'm about to say and then convert it into hagar fleur language where it, it comes out more naturally, but... Um, but it, it's the right notion for, for us. And uh, you say, take a rational slope, and what do you do? Uh, you take a, I want, I want to glue together M with N. Remember, N is a twisted eye bundle over the Klein bottle. 
And F is a homeomorphism from boundary M to boundary N. And I wanted to take the slope uh, alpha to the, what's called the rational longitude of, uh, so that's a, there's a well-defined slope on the boundary of this called the rational longitude. And I want the gluing map to do this. And uh, you say, let's call this, uh, well, I won't call it anything. Say that alpha is NLS detected if um, FN is not an L space. Okay, so this, you know, all seems ra rather ad hoc and unconnected to various forms of detection. But it turns out that the work I alluded to earlier about uh, showing for cipher manifolds, the three conjectures hold, well, that work, at least in a relative version of it, uh, shows you that there are very simple connections uh, and straight, you know, direct connections between these various ways of defining things. I don't have time to do it, but if anybody's interested, I can explain after. So I'll stop. <laughs>